Thank you, Brother Paul. Appreciate that very much. Take your Bible this morning, please, and go with me to the book of Genesis once again. Genesis chapter number 41. Genesis 41. And our message we've entitled is How to Live Life When Life is Good. How to Live When Life is Good. And uh, certainly, uh, if you've been here for our study, you understand um, that Last week, as we looked, Joseph's life took a little bit of a turn, and uh, not just a little bit, it took a 180-degree turn, and uh, so we're going to dwell on that this morning for a little while, and we're so glad that you've joined us. I want to uh, thank, uh, you know, what what we do here every Sunday morning and Sunday night is not just something that's, you know, necessarily just what we do here at the Cleveland Baptist Church. There are churches all across the face of the globe that gather uh, on a, for a worship service on, on a Sunday. Churches just like our church believe the same thing our church believes and practice the same kind of uh, ministry that we have. And uh, I've had the, the privilege here recently to be traveling some and preaching in some places. And it's always encouraging for me to see other churches, but it's also always encouraging to come back home to see that we're obviously still doing the same thing we've always done. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you for uh, obviously being faithful. I know that this morning the, the travel perhaps was a little sketchy for some folks. Uh, just as it was time for many folks to leave for church, as I shared, shared with my Sunday school class, it's like this, this curtain dropped, and it was white, and uh, it just kind of inhibited coming and going a little bit, and uh, maybe a little slipping and sliding, but you're here, all right? And we're going to ask the Lord to help you get home, and everything should be good. I, hopefully the roads will be clear by the time you go home today. Uh, we're sure grateful for the fact that you've made it safely, and we're looking forward to a great time together this morning. Would you stand, please, as we read God's Word together? If you're standing by someone who doesn't have a copy of God's Word, if you'd let them look on yours, we'll begin reading in verse number 39 of Genesis 41, and we'll read all the way down to the end of the chapter, please. Verse 39 of Genesis 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house." And according to thy word shall my people be ruled. Only the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah And he gave him to wife Asnath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of An. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Egypt. And all the seven plenteous years... The earth brought forth by handfuls, and he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, and very much until he left numbering it, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Athnath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of An bear unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manassas, for God, said he, hath made me to forget all my toil to all, uh, and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused him to be fruitful in the land of, uh, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness, which the land of Egypt work ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because the famine was so sore in all the lands. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to, again, congregate here in this place. Now, Lord, for the next few moments, it's our prayer that you'll quiet our hearts. Help us, Lord, as we give reverence and attendance to your word. 
Lord, give us an alertness this morning. I pray that you'd do something great in all of our hearts. Lord, help me as I speak. I pray that your power, Lord, would be uh, obvious and evident in this message today as it speaks to our hearts about our living. Now, Lord, we ask your help in these matters. Most importantly, we pray for the salvation of those who may be here today who have never publicly confessed their faith in Jesus Christ, that today would be the moment in which they would realize that need and respond to a call by the Holy Spirit to come and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We pray these things and ask them now in Jesus' name, and amen, and thank you. You may be seated. So when I speak this morning, of course, we're looking at Joseph's life taking this turn, but I suppose as we analyze life, as we look at lives, and I say use that as a collective term, all of our lives together, I suppose everyone has had what I call some rough patches or places in their life. And what I mean by that is I mean that nobody gets through life without having some issues or troubles or trials to deal with. I don't know anyone who has lived what I would call a storybook life. I often say I feel like I'm very blessed that I've not really had a lot of issues to deal with, although I've dealt with some things in my life and had to deal with some pain and some issues. But I'm just simply saying, uh, nobody gets through life without having to deal with some hardship and some, some grief and some sorrow. There's no question about that. And in our study of Joseph, we looked at his life, and up to this point, it's been pretty difficult. In other words, until you get to Genesis chapter 41, I, I mean, his life is, well, I could just say it this way. His life is what I call dysfunctional. Uh, you talk about a dysfunctional life, and somebody that's had to deal with a lot of sorrow, Joseph is that man. Uh, I, I just recap for just the sake of, of the point this morning. Joseph is born into a family. His father was married to two women, sisters. I mean, it's bad enough to be married to two women, but you add the, the, obviously the, to that equation that those women were sisters, and it's like two cats fighting all the time, all right? And, and so you have that, and then you add to that equation two other women who are brought in to bear children, what are called concubines. So he has children by all these four women. They're all living in close proximity one to another, and it makes for a very dysfunctional home. His father, Jacob, has these 12 sons, but yet of the 12 sons, he plays favorites, and Joseph is that favorite. And while some of you say, well, that's a blessing. No, it wasn't a blessing because it made Joseph's life difficult. So we add that to this equation. Joseph, uh, of course, is given a dream in his teenage years. God shared with Joseph uh, uh, this dream that revealed the future, that at some point, Joseph would become this powerful man and, and people would bow before him. He'd be this great ruler. And, and Joseph then obviously shares that dream with his with his brothers and his brothers hate him they hate him because of this dream but they hate him because he's a favorite and, and so you have this this kind of thing playing out daily in this home uh, according to the bible his brothers hated him so much they plotted to kill him uh, we've seen some of that stuff play out in our in our society today where we hear of, of children killing siblings and killing parents. Well, well his brothers were like that. They li literally wanted to kill Joseph. However, rather than kill him, they decided, well, let's profit off of this. We'll, we'll sell him. And they sold him into slavery. And well, obviously, we read about his life down in Egypt. He's bought as a slave, as a servant in Egypt by a powerful man. And while he's in that home, he's accused by that man's wife of a terrible act. And as a result of that, he's obviously uh, innocent, but he's on these trumped up charges. He's sent away to prison and spends some time there. We don't know how long, but he spent a considerable amount of his time in his, what we call his adult part of his early life. He spent a, a considerable amount of time in this prison situation. Now, my point is this. You know, this is kind of the stuff that stories are written about. This is the kind of stuff that almost is, if you were going to do that today, if you found somebody like this today, they'd be making a movie about this. This would be a documentary. You know, somebody would be documenting this kind of dysfunction and all that's going on in this situation. And so I'm saying that obviously Joseph had a series of events that nobody here would really want to experience or have to go through. But yet he went through that. And I'm sure that there are folks in this auditorium this morning you could, can identify maybe with some of those things. Maybe, maybe a number of things have happened in your life. It's probably just the nature of ministry, but 
but honestly, it seems like a good part of ministry is spent in helping people when their lives have fallen apart. Uh, there are times, of course, as a pastor, when I've had people call me and say, can I sit down and talk to you? And they come in and they share with me that their marriage is falling apart and, and life is not good at this moment because of, of the situation that's unfolding in their life. It, it, it could be a, a bad report from a doctor. Uh, they've gone and had some tests run. The doctor has come back and said, look, uh, this is not good. And, and so their life is falling apart at that moment physically because of the things that are happening in, within their body. It could be a child that's decided to leave their life, live their life and they leave God out of the equation. And as a parent has tried to raise their, their child in the things of God and all of a sudden a child takes a turn like that in their life, it, it, it's very disheartening and it brings a lot of stress into a life. And, and so some folks perhaps can identify with that this morning. And, and all these things have a tendency, think about this, to rattle our life to our very core, to, to really shake us and, and cause us to, to reflect on some things. Now I have to tell you that probably most of us, and I'm including myself in this when I say this this morning, most of us don't perhaps appreciate how good our lives are until we get into one of those spots. In other words, we, we in many respects maybe live our lives in, in this regard with maybe just taking our life for granted. The blessings of God that have been bestowed upon us, a good health and a good marriage and children who live for the Lord and, and, and just things are good in your life. And sometimes when life is good, we have a tendency to take our relationship with God, perhaps the, the blessings of God for granted and we don't necessarily appreciate them as much as we should until our life falls apart. It's amazing how some people seem to thrive spiritually even though they've been handed some very difficult things to deal with in their life. Uh, it's that hardship that sometimes has a tendency to drive us to God or perhaps draw us close to the heart of God. In your hymn book this morning, I won't have you turn to any of them, but there are a number of hymns, and the author would be the name Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby. She was a dear lady. She was born March the 24th in 1820, so she lived a long time ago. She was born in a place called Brewster, New York, about 50 miles from New York City. And when she was just six weeks old as a baby, through a doctor's mistake, she lost her eyesight. It was irreparable. They couldn't do anything to fix it. This little baby who obviously had, was born with, with, with healthy eyes now has lost her eyesight. And Fanny became a blind with no hope again of having her vision back. She wrote her first poem when she was eight, and it dealt with her difficulty. Listen to what she wrote. Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I'm resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot, nor I won't. I love that. I love that, that positive spin on life when you could pity yourself and look at life and say, well, I've been handed a, a bad lot. This is not fair. No, she refused to pity herself. In fact, she spent the rest of her life, listen to me, writing 8,000 poems and hymns, many of them that are found in your hymn book, like Blessed Assurance, uh, My Savior, first of all, and Face to Face We Shall Behold Him. These are all songs that were written by this dear woman who had this terrible situation unfold in her life, but... She used it to let God use it in her life to draw her close to the heart of God. Now, it's obvious that Fanny Crosby didn't allow this so-called handicap from keeping her from knowing and serving the Lord. Well, in our story, we see Joseph has had some tough spots in his life. He's dealt with this dysfunction, but now that, that coin has been flipped over. And it's not just a slow flip, but it's a very quick, very instantaneous situation. The, the dream that God gave him as a boy growing up in his father's house in Canaan now becomes a reality. And as we shared last week, Joseph awoke in prison one morning. He had on his prison garb and he got up and ate his prison breakfast and he, he was going about his prison duties when all of a sudden his name was called and they said, Joseph, you are now being summoned and you need to shave, you need to clean yourself up, you need to change your clothes. You're gonna stand before Pharaoh. And thus, into the presence of Pharaoh, he went. That day, by the end of the day, he was now second command the most, in the, of the most powerful man in all of Egypt. He'll go from being a nobody to becoming a somebody in Egypt. His name will become a household word 
His story will be rehearsed and told over and over again. Can you believe it? This guy woke up in the morning in prison, but by the end of the night, he's vice president of all of Egypt and a powerful man. When he speaks, people listen. It's the stuff legends are made out of. And Joseph is living this dream. So here's my question this morning. When we take a story like this and life is kind of turned on end in a, what we would call a positive side, how should we live life? How should we live life when life is good? Well, the text reveals to us of all the things that changed in Joseph's life in short order. Notice in verse number 41, he's very instantly elevated to this new powerful position. Verse 41 says, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I've set thee over the land of Egypt. I I don't know that I can almost wrap my mind around that. I'm reading it and I I say, okay, I, I believe this, but can you imagine to live that? I mean, you wake up in the morning and you I mean, even in the prison, you don't have any authority. You're waiting on people. You're serving people. And yet, at the end of the night, and now all of a sudden, I'm setting you over the entire land of Egypt. You know, in some respects, one of the things you have to love about the United States of America is what we call the transition of power. So we think about a president who's elected. So we just went through this situation here recently where we had an election and now we have a new president. And up to that point, up till January the 20th, he's called the president-elect and he can speak, but he really has no authority. He, 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 may, he may make some announcements, he may make, make the news, but you, you think about noon on January the 20th and we have one man at 11.59 a.m. sitting there who is the president. And if something happens, I mean, all the authority resides with him. But at the stroke of noon and the man takes the oath of office, that authority now is transferred to a new leader and our country then transforms to that new administration. So we think about this, this idea of power and in many respects it kind of mirrors this only in a, in a little different way. But the point is, is that Joseph had no authority in the morning but by the time he went to bed at night he is a powerful, powerful man in Egypt. Notice also in verse number 42 his, he's given a new wardrobe. Now, again, I'm telling you that probably in prison, the the Bible doesn't tell us what he wore, but I am guarantee you they weren't brand new clothes. Probably they had to be patched and patches on patches and maybe threadbare here and and not looking so good. And yet, by the end of the day, he's given these beautiful garments to wear that speak of his position of power and, and that he held, according to verse number 42. Notice he rides in the second chariot. The announcement goes out that he's coming. And as he's coming, people are to bow. They're to clear the way. Get out of the way. The the vice royal of Egypt is coming. Bow the knee. Notice he's given also a new name according to verse number 45. Look at that verse again, please. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Paneah, and gave him a a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potipharai, the priest of An. Now, it's interesting that Pharaoh chose this name. Again, it's probably not the name that you would name your child. It may be Tom or Dick or Harry. But here, this man is given this name. Notice again, it's Zaphnath Paneah. Uh, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, one of the things I think parents do sometimes is, is they don't always think about the names they give their children and how difficult that is for a kid who's learning how to write the first time. So you imagine Joseph saying, okay, now I got to write my new name, Zaphnath Paneah. Joseph's a whole lot easier, isn't it? Just call me Joe. We'll shorten it up. But, but the truth of the matter is, so he's got this kind of moniker that's hanged about his neck. And, and here's what that name means. Pharaoh knew that this name means God speaks and lives or savior of the world. So it kind of speaks to the situation which Joseph is in. He's, he's now obviously revealed this dream and what's going to happen. There's going to be these seven years of plenteousness. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so it needs to be prepared for. And so Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, okay, you told me that it's God who's going to reveal this dream. And I want you to know that I believe that God lives and that God's going to be the savior of the world. Don't you love that when the world responds to to the faith of God's people? So he's given this new name that speaks powerfully. Notice he's given a wife, a lady to be his wife to encourage and help him, according to verse number 45. And then the Bible speaks of him given two sons. Their names speak of Joseph and his positive attitude of this difficulty. Look at verses 50 to 52 again. And notice, please, the oldest one is given this name Manassas. 
if you're in the habit of underscoring things in your Bible and maybe writing things in the flyleaf of your Bible, you might want to underscore the name Manassas or, or circle it and maybe draw out to the flyleaf of your Bible and write the name Forgetting. Forgetting. What Joseph is saying here is that Manassas, God has helped me through Manassas. He's, he, he's saying through this son's name, God has helped me to forget my past. All the difficulty, all the hardship, all the, all the difficulty of my father's house and the fighting of my brothers. God has helped me to put that behind me. Can I help you understand something today? Some of you need to let go of some things of your past. You need to forget about some of those things. Some of, it, some of it's holding you back today from being what God wants you to be. Some of it's making you bitter today. You need to get over it. You need to forgive some people. I, I'm telling you that, that, that it's not helping you this morning. Bitterness doesn't help anybody. It, it destroys you and it, it destroys everything you come in contact with. So forget. Joseph said, look, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm, I'm going to forget about the past. All the hardship, all the grief. I'm telling you, I'm forgetting. Manassas helps me to forget. Then he knows his other son, his name then is Ephraim. And I want you to underscore that name and then write to the flyleaf of your Bible the word fruitful. Fruitful. Notice what he says there about Ephraim. He, he says, verse 52, and his name of uh, the second is called Ephraim, for God hath caused me to become fruitful in the land of my affliction. It, man, God has turned the corner. God's made my life blessed. I'm, I'm a blessed person because of, of God. Now, the focus of this last section, this 41st chapter, is of Joseph and is living his life after difficulty. Joseph is a great picture of being right with God through all aspects of life. Now, the truth of the matter is, some people seem to keep their focus when they're humble. Well, I don't have any choice. I mean, my life is pretty rough, and it's hard to be, have a lot of pride because of all the difficulty and all the hardship and all the grief. It's hard for me to kind of, you know, get, get, any, get ahead in life. Some people do all right by then. And then comes the day when they're blessed and success is handed to them, and sometimes people that do well in humility and difficulty forget about God when success and blessings come. You know, God is aware of that, don't you? God is aware that sometimes we do well when things aren't so good. But then when, the, when, we, when we, again, we get a little bit better, God is aware that, you know, people have a tendency to forget about me. God warned his own people, the nation of Israel, in the book of Deuteronomy, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. That generation that was 20 years old and above when they failed in, after about two years of coming out of, out of Egypt, and they had the opportunity to go across the Jordan River and conquer Canaan. And they said, no, we can't do it. And God said, all right, everybody that's 20 years and old and above will die in the, promise, or in the wilderness. And for the next 38 years, they tramped around. And that generation all died. Now this new generation has now come to be adults. And they're the ones that are going to conquer the land. And God says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse number 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which I swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and good cities that thou buildest not, and houses full of good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees that thou plantest not, and when thou shalt have eaten and be full, listen, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, and from the house of bondage. What's God saying? He's saying, okay, you've done, this generation's done pretty good. You've been tramping around the wilderness. You have to depend upon me every day for, for manna to come down and for me to provide water. And, and you've looked and your clothes have not gotten old and your shoes have not, have not been destroyed. And I blessed you. But I'm going to bring you across and you're going to have cities. Cities filled with good stuff. Houses that you didn't build and, and wells that you didn't dig and olive yards that you didn't plant. And I'm going to bless you. But I have concern. I am concerned that when you're blessed that you'll forget about me. You know, Solomon did that very, did very well early in his life, in the early days of his leadership. His spirit was tender and his heart was humble. However, when Solomon had great success, when the hand of God was upon his life and he began to bestow blessing upon Solomon, he became this powerful man. The Bible says that Solomon forgot about God, turned his heart from him. So today we look at Joseph in this season of his life and there are things that we can learn from him that will help us, I believe, today. Life is good for Joseph, and in this section, it shows us how to live our life in that season of life. Notice, first of all, as we think about Joseph in this season of life, I want you to notice that he kept his focus on God. When life was good, he kept his focus on God. There had been days in Joseph's life when he was struggling, and perhaps he was wondering what God was doing. 
I mean, it would be just natural, wouldn't it? The Bible doesn't really tell us this, but it would be natural if you were Joseph or I were Joseph, it'd be natural. Okay, I've got this dream, and, 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 and you have to know that Joseph understood the dream. If he could under, interpret other people's dream, he could interpret his own dream, right? I mean, that just makes sense. So, so he has to know, hey, hey, there's a future out here for me. But all of a sudden, his life kind of turns south. His brothers sell him into slavery. He's down in Egypt. Then he's accused, and he's thrown into prison. You, you have to wonder, okay, God, how does this play into this dream? I'm supposed to be this powerful man at some point in my life, so how on earth does this play out in my dream? So his, his focus throughout those times of testing would be upon God. It's, he's just saying, okay, God, what's this all about? And so we, we see that. And so as a result of that, he's, he's dealing with that. And yet the Bible shares with us, Je- Joseph just kept doing day by day, even in the difficult things, the things that he should do. He, he didn't quit. He didn't get angry. He didn't curse God and his day. But the day comes when everything changes. I mean, we just read that, didn't we? Pharaoh says, okay, Joseph, you're now second in command of all of Egypt. Yet in spite of the success and blessing, Joseph just keeps his focus on the Lord. Now, let me help you understand something this morning. Because I think we we say, well, you know, we're reading this story. Yeah, that's, that's easy. Do you understand Joseph doesn't have a church? Joseph doesn't have a Bible. Joseph doesn't have anybody really there to encourage him. He's living in Egypt. Egypt is filled with distractions. Egypt would be filled with a lot of ungodly, wicked people. Egypt would have a lot of issues that would be at play that would draw him away. And being a powerful leader, there there isn't anything that Joseph couldn't have if he really wanted it. I mean, he could let his guard down. Well, you know, I can kind of let some things go today. And and Joseph could have destroyed his life when God brought him to this place, but he didn't destroy his life. You know why? Because he kept his focus on God. Kept his focus on God. Even the names that he gave to his son show his focus was upon God. He never forgot that focus. And listen to what God says to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? This is a requirement of the nation of Israel, but it's also a requirement of us. What does the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul? You want to know what God wants of you today? He wants you to fear him today. He wants you to understand that he loves you today. If you're here and and you don't have a personal relationship with God, you may know about God. You may know about Jesus Christ. You may may think, well, you know, I've always been a Christian. You haven't always been a Christian. You're not born a Christian. You're born again a Christian. There has to come a time when you understand that God loves you. And and as you hear that and that, that Jesus died for you, you must personally respond to that. God expects you to fear him. And as a result of fearing him, it's not a fear. The fact that I quake in his sight, but that I reverentially awe him of who he is and that he would take consideration of me and deal with my sin upon the cross of Calvary. What does the Lord require of thee? That thou fear the Lord, that you serve God with your heart, with all your soul. I love Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8 talks about what God's expectation is of us as well. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. May God help us today to keep our focus, our focus on God. No matter what's going on in your life today, whether your life is falling apart this moment or if you're at the peak of success today, keep your focus on God today. Let that be your focus. Secondly, Joseph not only focused on his God, but Joseph focused on his family. We're getting ready here in the month of February to focus on the family as a church. It's family month at Cleveland Baptist, beginning Wednesday night. And we're going to do a lot of preaching and teaching on family and family relationships. But I, I'm, I'm telling you, that every indication is that Joseph loved his wife and his sons. They filled, think about this, they filled this lonely void in his heart. He was part of a family. He loved his father. His father loved him. But he's ripped prematurely out of that situation and thrust into some bad circumstances. I don't have to, I, honestly, I, I suppose Potiphar, the man he worked for, probably appreciated Joseph and his production and how he made his house to prosper, but he probably didn't love Joseph. And his wife is throwing herself at Joseph. She looks at him as some kind of toy to be had. 
And certainly at, up to this moment, I'm just simply saying that there's really been a lot, loss of family relationship there. I may be speaking to some folks, and you really don't have a family at this moment. Do you know God can become your father? Amen. And your church family become, can become your family? Amen. You can have a relationship with, with someone. If you say, man, I, there's a loneliness in my heart. God wants to fill that void today. And he filled the void in Joseph's heart by giving them a, a wife and, a, and some sons. No doubt, Joseph spoke to them about and led them in worship of the true and living God. He's living in this heathen land, and, and her father was a priest of An. And obviously, he had some sort of religious affiliation, but uh, no doubt, Joseph said to his wife, as an ass, look, I, I don't worship false gods. I, I worship the true and living God. And she, he no doubt brought her into the faith, and these sons that were born to him became worshipers of the God of Israel. No doubt about that. Listen, children of Christian parents need their parents. Listen, listen, parents, listen to me today. Your children need something from you. Amen. They need a lot of things from you besides food and shelter and clothing. If you have children here today, your children need to see you walk the path of a Christian. They need to see you flesh out in your daily life what it's like to love God and to live for God. That's your responsibility as a parent. Don't bring them to this church and say, well, it's the church's responsibility to turn my kids off. No, we're here to help you. We will. But we can't do it for you. Amen. That's your responsibility. Right. Dad, it's your responsibility to be the man of the house and to lead the family. Oh, Mrs., it's your responsibility to be supportive of spiritual things and, and to be the mama that you should be that walks with God and loves the Lord Jesus Christ and prays for those kids on her knees and asking God to help turn them out for the things of God. Amen. So Joseph focused on his family. Notice Joseph focused on his work. He understood that there was a timeline in what God was doing. He had seven years to accomplish a plan. Seven years of plenty weren't years to waste. Sometimes when the money's flowing, sometimes when things are good, we sometimes aren't as industrious as we should be. I want you to notice that Joseph, uh, please, verses 48 and 49, notice what it says there. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt. And he laid up the food in the cities and the food of the field which were round about every city. Laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered the corn of the, as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering. For it was without number. Notice verse 53 as well. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. So obviously he had to focus on something. Joseph gives us a picture of a wise man who is industrious, hardworking, and focused on accomplishing that plan. And he won't let anything keep him from getting that work done. There's something else. I want you to notice that Joseph focused on preparing for the future. He focused on that. Part of Joseph's work was a task of preparing for lean years that were coming. They were sure to come according to the dream that God gave to Pharaoh. And Joseph understood that if he didn't get that food in the barns, if he didn't lay it up, that there were going to be some people that would die as a result of it. Listen to me. It's always wise to prepare. It's always wise to prepare. I, I don't know what the future holds. We, we look around and say, well, we live in America. Man, you go to the grocery store and there's always food on the shelves. There's always milk in the cooler. There's always bread on the shelf. There's always, I mean, I mean there's not just one kind of baked beans. There's 10,000 kinds of baked beans, you know. We live in America, for heaven's sakes. Land of plenty. Do you know that could change? It could change in a heartbeat. And I'm telling you this morning, it, wouldn't be, it would be wise, it would be prudent for us to be a little bit wise in some of the things we do. I, I don't know about you, but I don't know that's wrong to lay up a little bit of food. It wouldn't be wrong to maybe put a little bit of water aside. I'm not trying to be a, a fear monger here today. I'm just simply saying, man, Joseph said, hey, be wise. In, in the good years, be wise about what you do. Years ago, we had a lady, part of our church family. You probably heard me say this before. Her name was Mrs. Curry. Mrs. Curry had a fairly large garden. And I go to her house, because I was running Young and Hearts back in those days. I go to her house, and she lived in a little house, an old farmhouse, actually, on Fry Road. She had this large piece of land behind her. And every year, her husband, John, would overturn the garden back there, and she would plant beans. I mean, I mean, just bean stock after bean stock, and plant after plant, and you'd walk in her basement, I'm telling you, the, the shelves were lined with, with canned goods that she had put up. 
And I said to her often, I said, well, when the famine hits, I know where I'm coming. She's prepared. Well, I'm just simply saying, you know, it, sometimes it's wise just to prepare. Uh, make, let's make this personal today. Think, think about this. I, I'm just let me help you understand something. I've got to hurry through this, the rest of it. 24% of American families have no savings at all, 24%. The average credit card debt in America is $2,600. That's the average man, woman, and ch- child. If we average it out, that's what it would average. 52% of Americans find it hard to pay their bills. 18% of Americans spend more than they make. Look, I raise kids. I know how hard it is. Man, I, I, there were times when we had more month than we had money. There were times when I, I didn't know how on earth we were going to make it. But l- let me help you with something. You can have God on your team. Did you know that? Amen. You can put God on your team. And here's how you do it. You make him first in your life. Amen. You honor God and God will say, look, I'll take care of your needs. He promises that. He said, he, he said, my God shall supply, Paul said this, he said, my God shall supply all of your needs. He didn't say wants. A lot of things I'd like to have, wants. Man, I'd like to have a 52-foot Winnebago sitting in my driveway and I'd like to have a Harley in my garage and I'd like to have this, I'd like to have, no, honestly, all that stuff, you know what, you heard me say last week that the dumbest bumper sticker I ever saw in my life is the one that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's a stupid statement. No, no, God says, look, I'll make sure that you, look, I'll make sure that you have some food to eat. I'll make sure that you have some shelter. If you honor me, I'll take care of you. So Joseph kept his focus on God. He, he obviously focused on his work. He focused on savings. But notice if you would, in, in, in being um, wise in stewardship, notice he focused on saving the world, verses 54 to 57. And then we have to end here. Joseph was going to give them corn. If he was going to give them corn, then he had to prepare that. And he was going to have to physically sustain them. And he, he did that through working his plan and preparing and saving for the known dirt that was coming. He becomes a blessing, not only to Egypt, listen, but he becomes a blessing to the world. Let me draw this conclusion today. Just simply say to all of us, as we think about our lives, our lives aren't to be used just for our selfish pursuits. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, you're not just to live your life for yourself and what you want. No, God says, look, my life is given to me to serve him. Now, now God's been very, very good to me. In fact, honestly, he's been far better to me than I deserve. But, but I want to tell you that really my life is not about you know, how much of this world can I get? It, it's not about saying, you know, well, I, I'm going to make my plan that serves me. No, no, it's really about knowing God and, and trying to serve him. The gospel message is something that has changed and impacted our lives. And look, we know the inevitable is coming, don't we? Anybody sitting here thinking you're never going to die? No, no, uh, the only reason you won't die is if Jesus comes and he takes you, but you're still dying. You're still going to leave this world behind. Uh, look, look, the house that you live in, I mean, the moment you die, it becomes somebody else's. The clothes that hang in the closet, the moment you die, you won't need them again. They may need, you may need a suit of clothes to bury you in there, but that's all you're going to need. The money that you save and the stocks that you stockpile. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I'm, I, look, I'm all for preparing for the future. But there's more to living than just living. Amen. You live for eternity. Live with that focus in sight. We sometimes fail to seize a moment. And when we fail, we need to determine, look, I'm not going to allow that to happen again. When we, we let an opportunity slip through our hands, whether it's to tell somebody about Jesus or, or, or we, we blow something in our life, look, look, don't let that define you, but say, I'm going to get over that, and I'm going to do right the next time. So I don't know where you are in your life today. It may be a time of distress and difficulty. Well, if it is, let me point you to the one who can help you. You may be living in a time when life is good. If so, focus on God and Focus on family and focus on work and focus on preparing for the future and focus on helping save the world by sharing the message of Christ with other people. I got to tell you, I'm impressed with Joseph. I don't, I don't, honestly, there may be something in the Bible. I've studied his life over and over again. I don't find anything where the Bible really points out some flaw. And God is very careful about sharing flaws and warts with people 
who are of, of high regard. But Joseph, listen to me, Joseph is probably the most perfect type of Christ that there is in all of the Bible. Amen. And that's the kind of life we should, want, we should aspire to. We should want in our life. Now again, I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on in your life today. I may know some of what may be going on in your life today, but I'm telling you that God loves you today. And God wants your life to allow him to control it and to bless it. And it starts with a relationship with Christ. And if you have that relationship, then it's a determination that my life is going to be used to focus on God and to love my family and to focus on work and to focus on preparation for the future and focus on saving the world with a gospel message. Those are the things that will make your life fulfilled and having purpose. Would you bow your heads together with me in prayer this morning?